Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 81 of the weekly playback. So it is now September, so I am wearing an autumn themed shirt. I actually started getting into the whole autumn vibe in August, but it is actually over 80 degrees today. So I actually have the AC on in the other room. And um, yeah, but there were some days in August where it started feeling like autumn. So I swapped out my summer purse for my autumn purse and I'm like totally in the Halloween spirit. I've started decorating my house for Halloween. So yeah, so this 80 degree weather is just really killing the autumn vibes and it's actually supposed to be 90 degrees later this week so not looking forward to that um, so yeah so don't mind the AC if you can hear it from the other room um, I did play a number of games in this past week there are two games that I will not be talking about though that I did play and I'll talk about them later so the first is the White Castle which is Devere Games's uh, Essen 2023 release so that's going to be released in October in Essen um, and there's an embargo on um, how to plays and reviews until uh, towards the end of September so even though I play that I cannot talk about it but I will post a picture of um, when I was playing it because we're allowed to show components and Toffee was in the background um, so you can see him kind of sitting on his own game board in the back because he kept on trying to ruin our game board so I decided to pull out a game board from another game so that he could have his own board to sit on so yeah so he was super cute while he was sitting on and then sleeping on his own board and the other game I'm not going to talk about is um, fit to print because I played with someone else's copy and my copy has just been stuck in transit somewhere like the shipping label was printed and then there's been no movement since August 17th so I will wait to talk about that until I have my own copy so that I can show you guys the components and stuff so with that being said let's get into the games that I did play and that I can talk about Let's talk about Junk Drawer. So this is a 2023 game for one to four players designed by David Smith and it's published by 25th Century Games. This is a tile placement game in which you are also trying to uh, do some pattern building and fulfill different kinds of goal cards. So I played two games of this at two players. Um, so you are going to have a bunch of different junk components and I did uh, separate them into these bags. These are bags which I bought myself, which are Plymore bags, um, just because I wanted to give the pieces a little bit more breathing room than the bags that uh, came with the game. So you are going to separate all the junk pieces for each player. So each player is going to have the same junk pieces in their own bag and their own supply. And then you are going to have a board that looks like this and you'll see that there are four different colored squares on this board and it is dual layered so the pieces won't move around once you like have them in the square that you're putting them in so the reason that there are four different colors is because on this board there are going to be four different goal cards that you are trying to meet so there are easy goals medium goals and hard goals so this is a game that is very easy to learn, by the way. So for example, here's an easy goal. So this one says that you will score four points per item that is put into that square. So for example, if this was in the red square, then all your items in the red square on your own player board are going to score four points per item. Uh, here's, uh, let me show you a medium goal. Here's a medium goal. So this one says four points per row and column containing no uncovered spaces. So this means that any full rows and columns will score four points each. So that is an example of a medium goal. And an example of a hard goal is this one three points per gap of exactly one space. So naturally that's going to be harder to complete because you're going to need to you know, have gaps that are just exactly one square and then you'll get three points each for those. So you're going to have a goal on each of these squares and then those will correspond to your own player board. And once the game ends, you will score each square separately and then you'll total up the points and then whoever has the most points will win. So how do you put items onto your boards? So. You are going to have these item cards and these item cards are going to show all of the items that each player has in their supply and i will show you the examples of the polyamino pieces so for example let's see so you know there's just different polyamino shapes like the coins are this shape um, this one is a flashlight and it takes up a whole row or column so for example let me just pull out this board uh-oh so the flashlight, if you put the flashlight down, it's gonna take up a whole row or a column, which is five spaces. 
Um, you have like some sewing stuff. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. There's like sunglasses and tape, like just the kinds of things that you would find in a typical junk drawer. Uh, there's even cat treats, which I like. <laughs> there's even a button. So the button is the smallest piece which is just one square. So all different kinds of items and each player has the same items. So at the beginning of a round, you are going to have four cards face down next to the board. Um, all of these are going to be shuffled, of course, at the beginning of the game, all the different items. And of course, there's only one card per item. Um, so you're going to shuffle all of these, put four of them face down and then reveal the first card. That is the first item that every player is going to have to place on their board in one of the squares. Then you reveal the next item. Now you cannot place more than one item into a square per round. So if you already put an item into the green square in this round, then the next item will have to go into one of the other three squares and so on. So each item is going to go into a different square in the round. If you come to a point in the game where a player cannot place their item because like, for example, let's say it's the fourth item in that round and they cannot fit it into their fourth square and they have to put it in that square because they already put items in the other three squares, then the game is going to end. So that will be the last turn of the game and then you will go on to scoring. So it's kind of like a little tricky because you don't know which items are going to appear and you are trying to fulfill these different goals with all of these different shapes and trying to put them into the appropriate squares, not knowing which items are going to appear and when the game end will be triggered. It is a really great game. Like it is so easy to learn. I'm not gonna say that it's hard to master. I'm just going to say that it is challenging um, because you know I don't think that this is a game you can master because you never know which items are going to come up, right? I mean, maybe you can master it. I don't know, maybe you're some polyomino math expert and can figure out a solution to do that. <laughs> but I don't know, because um, you don't know which items are going to come up. So um, you just kind of have to hope and pray that, you know, the items that you are putting into the squares, you know, will be good for those squares and then that there won't be an item that comes up that will be really bad for you. So like, for example, in the second game I played yesterday, the game end was triggered because my opponent could not place the flashlight. He did not have a single row or column available in any of the squares where he could put the flashlight. So the game end was triggered. So then, you know, once the game end is triggered, you're of course going to count up your points for each square. Um, so for example, here's one game that we played and here's another game we played. So you put in your individual scores for each square and then you get your total score and then you see who won. So in the first game I played, I got 56 points and in the second game I played, I got 58 points. So I happened to win both games. Um, but yeah, it's a really great game. I think, you know, for the first game we played, we had, I believe, one easy, two medium and one hard card. I think for the second game we played, I think maybe we had one easy and three medium I or maybe maybe we had a hard i can't remember but anyway but yeah it's a really great game super easy to learn like super quick teach and if you like polyamino games and you like challenging games and you like a little bit of uncertainty then i think you will love junk drawer so definitely check it out and by the way this was a review copy so i did receive this from 25th century games as a review copy so i did not pay for it myself but i do think it is a really great fun polyamino game and again super easy to teach so yeah so check out junk drawer Another game I played recently is Zoo Vadis. Zoo Vadis is a 2023 game for three to seven players designed by Rainer Knizia. The art is done by Quan Chai Moria and it's published by Bite Wing Games. This is a negotiation game with hidden victory points and yeah, and point to point movement. So I played a seven player game of this and that was the only play I've had of this game so far. Um, so. Firstly, I will say that when I showed this game, uh, when I received it, I showed it in the last video, I think, and I was like kind of sad that there's no elephants in this game. That was before I understood that the animals are not trying to escape from the zoo. <laughs> so now that I know that they're not trying to escape from the zoo, I am glad that there's no elephants because elephants do not belong in zoos, but there actually is an elephant here. I mean, I feel like no animals belong in zoos, but you know, if it's a really great zoo that has like actually cares about conservation and cares about the animals' well-being and 
and has large enough enclosures and you know gives the animals the social interaction that they need and all of that then great but um, you know if they're especially if it's a rhino and a ri you know rhinos are about to become extinct so in that case fine but if it's a zoo that only cares about making profits and does not care about the well-being of the animals then obviously I'm going to be against that so with that being said <laughs> in this game you are zoo animals and you want to be like the top exhibition at the zoo so you are trying to make your way first of all so this game is about points hidden points that you're going to earn and I'll talk about how you get those points but you're going to start each time um, each the game by having an animal placed here at the bottom somewhere and in order to even score your points you need to make it to one of the star spaces up here um, now it may be that you don't even get an animal there because there's seven spaces up here um, in, a, in a fewer player game you'll have five spaces but if you don't make it up there someone might be able to take up two spaces and then too bad for you because you won't even get to score your points so on this board you're going to see different pathways leading from enclosure to enclosure you'll see some enclosures have like five spaces some have three some have one um, and you'll even see like underground pathways which the armadillo's special ability will allow you to use so let me just show you some of the components and how this game works so i have the deluxe version so everything i have is like really nice like plastic so for example these point tokens are the really nice um, chips um, but if you have the regular version they're going to be cardboard and like likewise with the player screens my player screens are the really nice like quality ones um, so yeah, they're like thicker like cardboard and stuff. So each player is going to have a player screen which shows um, you know, which each animal's special ability is. So you're going to see all the special abilities of the animals and then your own ability at the bottom. So this is the hyena and it shows what the hyena special ability is. So I played as the marmo set because of course it's purple and there's no elephants in this game. So let me just show you some of the components. So each person is going to have six animals and they're so nice. So even in the standard version, you're going to get these really nice wooden pieces that are screen printed. These are really nice. And then um, in the regular version, you'll have cardboard um, ability tokens, but in the deluxe, these are also wooden. So you are going to put these onto your board as such. So the reason you're doing that is because that's gonna show all the other players that you have two ability tokens. So. Um, basically, in this game, you, on your turn, will have one action to use. And the various actions you can take are, so let me just make sure I don't skip over any, so I will uh, show. Okay, so the actions you can take are to advance, add an animal to the zoo. So the bottom section of the board that I showed you, you will add an animal there. Um, another action you could take is to advance one of your animals. Now to advance one of your animals, you need to have majority support of the exhibit that you are trying to leave or the zookeeper token is on the path that you want your animal to advance along. So if the zookeeper token is on the path, then you can just advance along it without getting majority support. But otherwise you need majority support. Let me see if I can find the zookeeper token to show you guys. Here it is. So this is the zookeeper token and it starts um, in this section of the board. So it's going to start over here near the section that everyone is trying to reach so that their points will be counted. But during the game, you will have the ability to move the zookeeper if you want to. So in my seven player game, you know, same thing. It started towards the top of the exhibition area where everyone is trying to get to. So if the zookeeper is there, then you do not need majority support, but um, and you can just use a zookeeper. So that is another one of the actions you can take. So in order to get majority support, you have to have people vote. Um, so if you have two animals, that already counts as two votes. So for example, if I'm in a, five, uh, uh, in a space that has five, in an enclosure that has five spaces, um, I would need three votes. And if I have two animals in there, then I just need one more vote in order for me to advance. When it comes to voting, that's where you can make all kinds of deals. You can, uh, you know, make deals with other players. Like, okay, if you vote for me, then I will let you use one of my abilities later. And that's why you have these ability tokens. You cannot use your own abilities. You can bribe other players with your abilities. So you can say, hey, if you vote for me and let me out of this enclosure, I will let you use my ability 
flexibility on a later turn. Whether you keep your promise or not is another thing, but you can bribe other players with your own abilities. And you can only, of course, your ability can only be used twice. So if it's been used by one player, you're going to put it face down. And then if you have your other ability used by another player, you'll put it face down. There is a way to revive your abilities, um, but we can get into that later. So everyone has two ability tokens that they can use to bribe other players. So you can make deals. You can make deals like, like I'll give you money if you let me advance. Um, you can make deals like, OK, you know, with other players saying, you know, don't vote for them and I'll give you money to not vote for them and so on. So really, like everything is up in the air, like you can make all kinds of bribes and stuff like that. Um, if you get the votes that you need to advance, then the players who voted for you will get to collect a laurel, that is a point token. And when you advance, you get to collect the laurel that was on the path that you advanced along. So that is one way you're getting points. Those are randomly placed on the board. So again, you're going to see on this board, all the different paths and along the paths you'll see these sections where the laurel tokens are going to be placed. And those are completely random, so they go up to a value of five, I believe, or maybe it's four. Let me see. I don't remember what the highest value is. Um, yes, the highest value seems to be five. And some of them you can see have different symbols on them as well, which like this one will let you re uh, put back a laurel onto your board so that the ability can be used again. I believe that that's what that one means. So yeah, so there's a bunch of different laurel tokens that are in this bag and they get randomly, randomly placed onto the board. So if the other players voted for you, they will get to collect one laurel each for voting for you as well. Um, so the, another action you can do is to advance a peacock. So there are some neutral kind of peacocks in this game. So the peacocks don't really belong to anyone and they get to roam freely, freely throughout the zoo, which is really cool because I feel like in every like animal park or like park that I've ever been to, like, and I only try to visit like ethical places, it's true. The peacocks are just kind of roaming freely and just doing whatever they want. So, so that's kind of like true to real life that the peacocks just get to roam around and do whatever they want. So one of the actions you can take is to advance a peacock. Um, and that helps because peacocks are, you know, they get to block out other players from taking up spaces and so on. And they get to leave an exhibit without majority support, of course, because you are, um, you know, just moving them as one of your actions if you choose to do that. And they don't collect laurel tokens when they move. Um, Another action you can do is to move the zookeeper, which we talked about earlier, because moving the zookeeper will then allow you to leave an exhibit and move into another exhibit for free uh, without collecting votes. However, when you use the zookeeper to do that, you do not get to collect the laurel token that is typically there. However, one of the animals does have an ability that would let you collect the laurel token, I believe. Um, yeah, it's the tiger. The tiger says, allow an animal moving over the zookeeper to collect the laurel. So if you made a deal with a tiger before and you can use their ability and they actually honor their deal, then you will get to collect the laurel. So yeah, so these are the rules that apply to animal abilities. You cannot transfer your ability tiles to other players. They are your animal's abilities. You cannot apply the power of your own ability tiles to yourself, only to other players. You may even apply the power of your own ability tiles to a peacock, but only when another player is advancing the peacock. The active player retains the right to accept or reject your power when advancing a peacock. It is possible for multiple players to use ability tiles in a single turn. After one of your ability tiles has been used, remove the tile from on top of your screen and lay it behind your screen. When another player takes their turn, they can ask you or you can offer to use your ability tile. So, you know, again, you can, you know, offer these uh, abilities as compensation and so on. Um, so yeah, so ending the game and winning the game. Okay, so the game ends immediately when all the spaces in the star exhibit are filled. So in a seven player game, that's seven spaces. And in a lower player game, that's like five spaces. At that point, all the players who have at least one animal in the star exhibit compare the number of laurels that they have collected. And then whoever has the most points would win. Um, if there's a tie, then it's the person who has the most, uh, no, the tied speed, uh, 
it's the person who reaches the star exhibit first. So that's why you have numbers here, because you put the animals in order in, in which they reach the star exhibit. So yeah, so that is Zoo Vadis. So this is very much like a pure negotiation game. It's not like a negotiation game where there's like other stuff going on. So for example, when I think of negotiation games, you know, one of the first games that comes to mind for me is Moonrakers. And Moonrakers is a deck building and negotiation game, a game of shrewd negotiation. Uh, there are no shrews in this game, by the way. Um, so yes, yeah, so in Moonrakers, you know, you're building up your deck and you're negotiating, trying to complete these different objectives in order to get points and money. So you can negotiate who gets how many points, who gets how many, how much money and so on. Like this, I would say there's nothing else going on except for negotiation. Like, yes, you are trying to collect laurels and that's the objective in order to win is to have the most laurels, but you're trying to get to the star exhibit. So, but really there's nothing else mechanically that's going on in this game. So if you really do not like negotiation games, I do not think that you will like this game at all. Um, when I backed this game, obviously, I really just backed it because it looks freaking amazing. <laughs> I mean, like the components and the animals, the artwork. I really love Quan Chai Moria's art. So, um, you know, that is what attracted me to the game. Um, quite honestly, um, you know, I love negotiation games, but I like them when there's something else going on as well. So with that being said, I'm not sure, you know, how much I like this game. Like I like it, but I'm not sure that, um, you know, it's one that I will want to play quite often. Like I think I'll have to really be in the negotiating mood. Like I'll really have to be in the mood to play like a pure negotiation game where there's like really not much else going on. Um, so yeah, so if you like games like that, then I think you will enjoy Zuvatis. Otherwise, it's probably a game that you might want to stay away from, even though the components in this are just really amazing. And yeah, I'm probably going to keep it just because the components are super amazing, even if it doesn't get played that often, just because I mean, really, the components are so freaking nice. And I just love all the animals in the game. So yeah, I'll definitely be keeping this in my collection. I just don't know how often it'll get played. So yeah, so that is Zoo Bodice. So if you love negotiation, it's definitely a game for you. Yeah. Another game I played recently is FICA. I think it's pronounced FICA, but honestly, I really don't know. So this is a 2022 game for two players designed by Quibus Game Design, and the art is done by Beth Sobel, and it's published by 25th Century Games. Now, um, this was a review copy that I received, by the way. So this is a set collection, simultaneous action selection uh, kind of pattern building game. So you are going to, I'll throw up a picture, but you're going to basically have a street and along the street, you are going to be trying to place cards in your own cafe. Um, so different cards, there's three different suits in this game. So you have green, brown, and pink, and the starting player will get to determine what the leading suit is. And then the other player will get to determine what the secondary suit is. Suits matter because when you uh, simultaneously choose a card to play, you're going to put it face down on your side and then reveal. And then the player who has the leading suit will get to go. But if two players have the leading suit, then the player with the highest number will get to use their action first. So on a card, what you will see is basically the suit, the color, the number of that card. It goes up to six. Um, you will see the action that that card allows you and the objective, if you complete it, how many coins you will get at the end of the round. At the end of the round, uh, when both players have five cards on their own side, you will see who has the most coins from objectives completed and then that player would win that round. And the first person to win two rounds will win this game. Um, so, you know, some of the actions, for example, are to swap one card from your hand with any one group. So a group is cards that are placed face down next to a card of yours. And a group shows these hands with these different types of coffee and stuff. So when you are scoring a card, if you have a group card next to it, if the three hands are facing you, you get to triple your score, your value of that card. If the the two hands are facing you, you get to double it. Um, the rule book is very unclear as to one point because it says that groups also benefit the player sitting across from you. So it says right here, 
Uh, let me just see. Since the other half naturally points to the other player, you can both benefit from a group, although one of you will benefit more than the other. It is very unclear that when the other player benefits, whether that will multiply their own card that is directly from you or the same card that you put down. And thematically, it makes no sense. So thematically, you are, you know, have two cafes on opposite sides of the street. And if one person has a group of people in their cafe, like let's suppose, you know, uh, the other person has this group in their cafe. Why would that benefit me in real life? Like I do not have these customers in my shop. So why would my score get doubled? Like that just makes no sense to me. Like thematically, it makes no sense. And we went on BGG and tried to find an explanation like, okay, so let's suppose my friend Tim has this on his card and I don't have a group on my card that's directly across from this one. And the three hands are facing him. So his score gets tripled from his own card. Now the rule book says that I also benefit. So does, do I triple or double the score? Cause I would have the two hands. Do I double the card that is on my side? or do I just take his score and double it and add it to my own points? The rule book does not clarify. Um, BGG does not clarify. So that was very frustrating for us. And quite honestly, we played one round and then we decided that we had seen enough of this game and we didn't need to play a second round. Like it just was, um, it was okay. It was, um, you know, you're placing down cards, you're taking actions if you want to and trying to just complete different objectives. But it wasn't anything like, you know, super... Um, it wasn't super thinky. Um, I guess it could be thinky, but, um, you know, if you're trying to complete different objectives, like, so for example, this one, you want two cards of the same suit next to each other in your cafe. And if you do that, you would get five points. This one, you want the first card to have a value number one and the last card to have a value number six. And if you do that, you get six points. So, you know, based on the different objectives you have, you may be trying to move around cards in your own cafe and messing up cards in your opponent's cafe and so on, because you can do that. Um, but the rule is that once someone has five cards in their cafe, you can no longer mess with their cards. You can only affect your own cafe. I'm not really a fan of this game. Um, like I said, we didn't even finish it um, just because we got really frustrated with trying to figure out that whole group rule and whether you would, you know, use your own cards points or the opponent's card points. And I don't know, it's just, you know, I was like, okay, this is an okay game, but not one I feel the need to keep or play again, to be honest. So I am actually going to donate this to, so the convention that I'm organizing, helping to organize um, in Ithaca, New York, which is the first weekend of New York, I will just donate it to their game library so that, you know, maybe some people will like it because I've seen it has very mixed reviews on BGG. Some people seem to love it, some people not so much. So hopefully there will be people at FlagCon who will like this game, um, you know, and again, like I've mentioned before, I'm not a fan of Beth Sobel's artwork. This game, I don't feel like the artwork is as, you know, unappealing as artwork of hers in other games. So, you know, the artwork I kind of even liked in this game, but typically I'm not even a fan of her artwork. Um, so yeah, but in this game, it wasn't that bad. So like, for example, like here's a mocha, um, here's a cappuccino. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I don't feel a reason to need to keep this game and I have other tea and coffee themed games. And one of my favorite tea and co uh, not tea, coffee themed games is Cafe from Pythagoras Games. And if you have not played Cafe, highly recommend it. I absolutely love that game. I love the artwork in that game. It's an, um, like an action kind of selection, like kind of game. It's really good. And also tile placement. So definitely check out Cafe if you are looking for a really good coffee coffee themed game. So yeah, so sadly FICA will not be staying in my collection, but I, you know, would like to thank 25th Century Games for sending this to me to give me a chance to try it out. So yeah, so that is FICA, the clever coffee break. So let's move on. The next game I'm going to talk about is Skull King. So Skull King is a 2013 game. Wow, 10 years ago for two to eight players. Um, it is designed by Brent Beck and Jeffrey Beck, and the art is done by David Bach, Eckerd Frey Tag and April Stott, and it's published by Grandpa Beck's Games. This is a trick-taking game. Um, this was sent to me by a viewer of mine, Arthur. So thank you, Arthur, for sending this to me. He also sent me uh, Gross Ghosts of Christmas, um, that trick-taking game from all play or board game tables. All play is their new name. So he sent me two trick taking games and I've now gotten the chance to play this one finally. So I played this, I believe at a six player account. Yes. So 
Um, so you are going to have a bunch of different cards in this game. So let me just show you some examples, but there are three suits in this game. So the three suits in this game, are there three or four? No, sorry, four suits in this game. The four different suits in this game are the yellow, the green, the purple, and the black. Um, black is Trump suit. Um, cards go up to a value of 14, I believe. I believe that is the highest you can get. There are some special character cards though. So let me just pull out some of the character cards so we can talk about it. Okay, so the special cards in this game, and by the way, I played like the bonus, the uh, basic version of this game. I did not play with the expansion cards. Like uh, there's some kind of expansion cards in this game, which I did not play with. So each player is going to have this and you are going to make a bid at the beginning of a round to determine how many tricks you are going to win. Um, so there are 10 rounds in this game. In the first round, you will be dealt one card. In the second round, you will be dealt two cards. In the third round, three cards and so on. So in the first round, there is only one trick to be won, basically. In the second round, there are two tricks to be won and so on. Um, so by the 10th round, there are 10 tricks to be won, but you can only bid up to a maximum of four. Um, so, and depending on whether your bid is correct or not, you may, you know, win points or lose points. So the way it works is um, after everyone, you know, so someone is obviously going to start and they set the suit. Um, so you, of course, in a big, like, just like in a regular trick taking game, you have to follow suit unless you can't, but you can also not follow suit and play a special character card instead. So the different kinds of special cards are an escape card. This has no value and will uh, assure that you do not win the trick. So this, if you want to lose a trick, you can play the escape card. The pirate, there are, so there's five escape cards in the deck. There are five pirates in the deck. Pirates beat all numbered cards. They are of equal rank with each other. So if more than one pirate is played in a trick, the person who played the first pirate wins. So again, there are five pirates and they beat numbered cards. So for example, the escape is not a numbered card. Um, but the escape doesn't matter because that would allow you to immediately like lose the trick. There is the Skull King. The Scourge of the Seas is the trump of pirates and beats all numbered cards and pirates, including the Tigress. So let me go to the Tigress because she's important. Um, I don't have her on hand, so just pretend I'm showing you the Tigress. So the Tigress, she, she is... Um, there's only one tigress. So you get to decide when you play her whether she counts as a pirate or an escape card. So if she counts as a pirate, she's going to beat all numbered cards. If she counts as an escape card, she's going to lose the trick. So the Skull King, he beats all numbered cards and pirates, including the tigress when she's played as a pirate. The only ones who can defeat him are the mermaids. So there are mermaid cards. Um, so here's a mermaid. So mermaids beat all numbered suits, but lose to all of of the pirates with the exception of the skull king who is lured by their treasure so if both mermaids end up in the same trick the first one played wins the trick so if you have so this got confusing at one point because in one round we in one of the tricks we had someone play a pirate a skull king and a mermaid so when that happens i cannot remember who wins the trick it said something it didn't mention Oh yeah, if a pirate, the Skull King, and a mermaid are all played in the same trick, the mermaid always wins the trick regardless of order of play. Only the mermaid capturing the Skull King bonus is earned. Okay, I don't know what that means because I don't think we played with bonuses. So if you guessed your number of tricks correctly, so we use the basic scoring, which is the Skull King scoring. So for example, if you bid one or more and you were correct with the number of tricks you won, then you are awarded 20 points for each trick taken. So let's suppose you guessed that you would win two tricks, that's 40 points. If you bid zero, which is amazing. You actually want to try to bid zero if you can, especially in the higher rounds and get zero tricks, because if you do, you'll get, you're gonna get mega points. So bidding zero and getting your bid correct and uh, you will get 10 points times the number of cards dealt that round. So for example, let's suppose it's the ninth round, you bid zero, you will get 90 points, 10 times nine. So that is freaking amazing. Um, if you were incorrect, um, so let's suppose you bid zero and then take one or more tricks. You'll lose 10 points per card dealt that round instead. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Yeah. 
Oh, so, oh, also, if you uh, capture more or fewer tricks than you bid, um, so like let's suppose you bid one or more, you'll lose 10 points for every trick that you were off and you don't earn points for any tricks captured that round. So you want to try to be correct because otherwise you lose points. So yeah, so that is how Skull King is played. So it is 10 rounds, so it is a bit of a long trick-taking game, <laughs> um, especially as you end up having more tricks in the later rounds. So I mean, for example, like, you know, the first round, it's only one trick, but then the eighth round, it's eight, eight tricks. Then the 10th round, it's 10 tricks. So overall, that is a lot of tricks in one game. So, you know, you gotta be prepared to play a long trick-taking game if you want to play Skull King. So, you know, I feel like you really have to be in the mood for this. Um, so yeah, so that is Skull King. So thank you again to Arthur for sending this to me. Oh, and the way you um, show your bids, you know, you go like, yo, ho, ho, and then reveal the number of bids that you're gonna vote. And then you, you know, place an, your uh, player aid card on top of it. Let's just pretend that this is a player aid card. So you would place it on top of this to show what your trick is for that round so you can keep track. So yeah, so that is Skull King. So let us move on. The next three games I will talk about very briefly because I've discussed them um, before. So I played six games of Patchwork on Board Game Arena. <laughs> so not with the uh, this copy, but like on Board Game Arena, I paid, played six games, which is great because it's so much more convenient to play. Um, you know, on Board Game Arena, of course, you're not going to have that, you know, in-person interaction and stuff, and you're not going to have the tactile nature of picking up pieces and stuff. So when we first started playing on Board Game Arena, we did not realize that you could actually choose which theme you want. So we were playing the Amara Kana, which, you know, I do not like those pieces. I think that they're kind of ugly. So then my friend realized that, oh, you can actually pick the Halloween edition. So the first three games we played with the Amara Kana one, but then the next three games we played with the Halloween edition and I'm like why wouldn't anyone just pick Halloween all the time like it's just so much more fun with the eyeballs and the spooky Halloween kind of pieces so yeah so if you don't know Patchwork it's a game by Uwe Rosenberg it's a two-player two tile placement game in which I always get a ton of negative points <laughs> so I don't remember all of my scores now from the six games I played online um, but if you like tile placement games then um, this is one to definitely check out, but you can lose a lot of points because of all the empty spaces you have. And it's you know quite a balance between deciding whether you want to fill up more spaces on your board and pay more. But if you do that, you're probably going to advance on the time tracker even quickly, more quickly, and you know end the game sooner for yourself. So it's really a balance between you know picking the bigger pieces and paying more, or and ending the game quickly, or uh, you know, trying to bide your time and get the smaller pieces and take your time, um, you know, and maybe earn less income as well that way. But, you know, you have a better chance of maybe filling up more of your board. Um, but along the board, there is going to be, along the time tracker, there is going to, there are these like bonus patches that people can earn. So the first person who gets to a bonus patch spot. So you're going to start at the start and as you, you know, pick up a patch, you're going to pay the cost of the patch in eyeballs. So I believe everyone starts the game with four or five eyeballs. I cannot remember. So for example, this patch costs one eyeball, but it will move you along five spaces on the time track, which is a lot. So like, for example, you get that patch, you're going to pay for it, but you have to move up one, two, three, four, five, in which case uh, you will pass an income spot. So every time you pass an eyeball, you get to collect income and the income is the number of eyeballs that is on all of your patches on your board. So again, you know, the bigger patches help to fill up your board more. So get rid of those empty spaces, which will be negative points at the end of the game, but you're going to be advancing much more quickly on this time tracker. And once you reach the center, you're done. So, you know, and um, also you have this like piece that's moving along over the patches, which determines which patch you get to choose from. So you're going to have this grave marker and every time you pick a patch, it's going to take the spot of the patch you picked and you can only choose from the first three ahead of this marker. So yeah, um, so here are the components in the Halloween edition. So the score markers for each player are pumpkins. So I like the colors, purple and orange. And as I showed that this is the Thing which determines which patches you're allowed to pick and here are the bonus patches which are great for filling in those empty spaces that you might be creating and here are the eyeballs your money 
and here are the patches. So a bunch of different patches in different shapes with different income levels on them, eyeballs for you to collect, and they cost a different amount and will advance you a different number of spaces. So yeah, Patchwork is a really good game. I really like it. It's much easier to play on BGA because, you know, otherwise you need like to you know, lay out all the patches randomly yourself and it's like a big circle around the board. So yeah, but it's much easier to play on BGA. So if you like polyamino games, highly recommend checking out Patchwork on Board Game Arena and you can choose the Halloween edition. So going forward, I will only be playing the Halloween edition on Board Game Arena. Another game I played a number of times again is Sea Salt and Paper. I've played this game at least five times now, I think. So I've only ever played it at two players though. So I've played this game a lot now. It's uh, again, as I mentioned in my last video, it's good. The theme has absolutely nothing to do with the game itself, which is like a set collection kind of game. Um, so yeah, but the artwork is really nice. This is designed by Bruno Catala and Theo Riviere and it's published by Bombix Games. Um, they are coming out with an expansion to add some more cards to this. So I'm going to try and pick that up at Essen when I am at when I'm at Essen next month, which I can actually say since it's September, which is crazy. My flight is actually exactly a month from now because I'm flying out on October 3rd and I will be landing in Germany on October 4th and Essen begins on October 5th. And finally, I played yet another game of Zuli. Um, so I don't even know how many play plays I'm at now with Zuli, but it's a lot. <laughs> so Zuli is a set collection, pick and pass set collection game. It's uh, the fierce and friendly set collection game. Um, I played with someone who'd never played before, so I got my highest score yet, but that's because he unfortunately made the mistake of not picking up as many enclosures as he should have in the first round, even though I advised him to. <laughs> so I tried to give him a tip that, listen, you really want to, you know, get these enclosures to store your animals in. But um, yeah, so I got my highest score, but yeah, I think I need a break from Zuli now. I think I've played it like a lot now. So I think it's time for a break from Zuli. So yeah, so those are the games I played in the last week. And of course I did play the White Castle and Fit to Print, but I will be talking about those later in the month. So let's move on. So let's talk about games that I am backing. So I reduced my pledge for Perch to $1. <laughs> so no longer um, backing that to receive the game. Um, you know, I'm a, um, I might reach out to the publisher and see if there's a way I can get a review copy from them in the future. Um, I did receive a review copy of one of their games at PAX Unplugged a few years ago. I received a review copy of um, City Builder, which is really a really great city building tile placement game, which I absolutely love. So yeah, so that's I think the only review copy I've ever received from them. So I'm going to see if I can get a review copy of Perch just because I am super tight on money. So we'll see about that. Um, of course, I'm backing favor the gods of Othera at one dollar so I can receive my production copy that's a game I covered for its kickstarter and it is fully funded which I'm really happy about because it is a really fun game like as I mentioned in the video in which I talked about it um, I played a six player game of it and we played at Barnes and Noble and a girl from the table next to us she asked us which game we were playing because it sounded like we were having so much fun and we were having a lot of fun so yes yeah, so favor the gods of athera which is like a tile placement exploration game and i am backing harvest so that is the new game from uh key master i think it's called is it called key master what are the yeah key master games the same publisher as parks um so harvest is a farming game I do not know if I should keep my pledge. Um, you know, it's a very cute game. I absolutely love like the animal artwork and everything. The pieces look fantastic. I mean, it's got this really cool cow. Oh, I love cows. There was a point in time when I was actually really obsessed with cows. So like, um, I just thought that they were like the cutest things. And so friends would like if they visited me, they would like gift me like a cow plushie and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I think cows are super cute. Oh, so yeah, so, um, you know, it's got a freaking amazing component. So it just looks really wonderful. And I am backing it currently at the Harvest Deluxe tier. So I got the early bird um, selection for that. So um, yeah, so that is $89. So yeah, so let me know if you're backing Harvest, why or why not? Because that may influence my decision. <laughs> so those are the only games I am backing right now. Um, I don't think I received anything new to show you guys. So let's move on. So I already announced this earlier in the video, but a section of this video, which I have not done in a while, is games that I am culling. And as I mentioned, 
while going over the scheme earlier in this video, I am calling FICA. <laughs> so, um, you know, thank you for to 25th Century Games for allowing me to play this, but it's just not for me. So I will be donating it to the game library of the convention that I'm helping to organize. So yes, so this is getting called. I wish it were that easy for me to make decisions about every game I own, because um, that would really help you know, reduce my enormous collection because I just have way too many games. Like there's no way that, you know, every game I own is even going to get played within the span of like two or three years because there's just too many. So there's games that are just going to be sitting unplayed on my shelf for a very long time. Uh, speaking of which, like I was just mentioning to my friend who was here for gaming yesterday that like, you know, I was looking at my shelf and I have these games which I backed on Kickstarter, which at the time I was like super excited for. And now no one even talks about these games. Like you never even hear of them. Like I backed Adele. Um, so that's like capital, all capital letters, A-D-E-L-E, -E, which, you know, seems like a really cool sci-fi themed game. But like who even talks about this game or even like plays it? I don't know. Like, OK, so it's a 2021 game. Uh, and it's got a 7.2 rating and it was just delivered to me maybe last year i don't know when it was delivered to me but i have not played it and i'm just like you know it was one of those games when it was on kickstarter it seemed like a must-have and now i kind of regret it because it's like oh gosh and the bad reviews are not making me very hopeful you know i think i backed it because i think rado said it was like really good or something like that and i just kind of you know, fell for it. And I was like, oh, I need to, you know, get this game because like Rado really loved it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But now did Rado, was it Rado who convinced me to get this one? I don't know if it was him or someone else. Maybe I shouldn't blame Rado because I actually don't think he covered it. Never mind. Maybe it was someone else. <laughs> I don't know if he covered it. I can't even find a video. I don't think it was him then. Maybe it was someone else because usually I trust Rado's opinions. Okay, so I don't know why I backed this game, but yeah, so I ended up backing this game and yeah, I have not played it and not really feeling like I'm going to play it anytime soon. Um, yeah, it looks like Tom Vassell covered it. Um, yeah, so if you backed Adele, uh, let me know if you enjoyed it. <laughs> so, so I really need to be more selective about games that I back um, just because, you know, there's so many games that just end up sitting on my shelf unplayed and then I look at them and I'm like, was it really necessary for me to back this game? Like um it you know it doesn't seem like a must-have game it doesn't seem like it's going to be a classic or a staple in my collection so yeah so i really want to become more selective oh yeah this review doesn't help me uh, doesn't make me feel good. It says a fairly dull game about surviving on a spaceship. The theme is cool, the game is good looking, but it's not my style of game. It's too long and it's just incredibly repetitive. Um, there are some good ideas about the player controlled AI in the game, but it doesn't quite make work, I think. So that's a bit disappointing. So yeah, so I definitely want to be more uh, selective about which games I back uh, for this reason, because I don't want to end up backing games that just sit there and then I feel like lukewarm about them. And you know, it was an expensive game. So like that's money I could have used on bubble tea or something. So yeah, or a better game. So so yeah, so I'm definitely going to be try to, you know, tr going to try to be more selective. So let's move on. So updates, um, as I mentioned in the last video, I'm going to Essen, which I'm super excited for about. So I will be working for Dronda Games at Essen. Um, I actually applied for a media badge just so that I could hopefully make use of any media rooms while I'm there on my downtime and stuff and I got denied. <laughs> so so the reason they denied me, <coughs> they said that they looked at my channel and determined uh, that most of my content is paid content, which is not true. Um, so if you look at my content, now most of my content is not paid, is not sponsored because like the only sponsored content on my channel is the overview videos. But all of these weekly playbacks and stuff like that are not sponsored. And those are the vast majority of my videos now. Like the vast majority of my videos are weekly playbacks not sponsored videos. Um, so I'm just kind of disappointed that I got, you know, denied a media badge because it would have been great to get all of those media emails and be able to set up appointments with publishers for my downtime when I'm not working with Dronda Games and so on. I wonder if there's an appeal process, I might just email them back and explain like, no, like most of my content is not sponsored, is not paid. Um, and my opinions are my own, but I don't know if they will 
reconsider or not. If they don't reconsider for this year, then next year I know that at least if I go next year, if I get the opportunity to work for Dronda Games or some other publisher again, um, because that would be cool if I can make it a yearly thing, um, because working for a publisher would make that possible because that would help me to save on costs. Um, so if it does become a yearly thing for next year, I know now that in my application to show them that no, most of my content is not sponsored. Um, so yeah, so that's disappointing that I didn't get a media badge. I'll have an exhibitor badge and I'll still have my business cards with me so I'll still go up to publishers and explain how I am a content creator um, and stuff but I just won't be getting all of those media emails that publishers send out prior to a conference so that kind of sucks. Um, FlagCon is moving along. Uh, we just had another meeting yesterday to talk about stuff, but you know, if you haven't booked your tickets yet um, and you would like to come to FlagCon in Ithaca, then please do consider booking your tickets. Um, so yeah, so that would be great. Um, I'll be there. I'll be playing. I'll be, I'm hosting three events right now and I might increase that number, but right now I think I'm only doing three. So I'm going to be hosting events for Three Ring Circus, Moon, and Petrichor. Um, okay, moving on. Let's go to questions and commentary. So from last week, um, not many of you gave me a fun fact about yourself, but that's okay. <laughs> so, um, so this week's question is, um, so this is inspired by FICA. So this week's question is, what are some games that you started playing but did not finish? So like you played one round or maybe didn't even finish a round or played maybe just a couple of rounds and then decided you're done, you don't even feel the need to finish this game. So three games come to mind for me. So of course, this, of course the first one is FICA. So we played one round of it and decided that that was enough, that we did not need to play two more rounds. The next game I will mention is Dungeon Pets. So back in the day when I was friends with Quackalope. So Jesse, uh, you know, and I were friends way back in the day. So he and Jan came to visit me for my birthday back in 2020, 2020, yes. Um, so we played a bunch of games and uh, one of the games that we had started playing was Dungeon Pets. So I thought I would absolutely love Dungeon Pets. So I was super excited to play it, but we did not even finish the game. I don't even think we finished like, I think maybe we finished one round and then we're like, yeah, it's not for us. Like no one was really feeling it. And I was not feeling it. Like I really thought I would love this game. Like, you know, it's got these cute little like animals in it. I don't I don't know what they were. Were they dragons or I don't even know what they were, but they were like these cute little like dungeon pets, like dungeon pets. <laughs> so and uh so they were really cute, like little gobliny looking things and stuff like that. Like I liked the animals and stuff in it, but the game just was not for me. Like the rule book and just trying to learn it and everything. I was just like, yeah, I I just like over this and I actually called it. So um I did not even um you know, we didn't even play a full game of it, not even like half a game. And yeah, so that was another one that I did not finish. And then the last one that comes to mind is a game that I covered for its Kickstarter, which was probably one of, I think, the worst games I've ever played. <laughs> so that was called Downtown Chase. So I remember when uh, the designer of this game reached out to me, like, the game from pictures looked like something I would really like. So I was like, wow, this seems really cool. And I remember, so I played with two friends of mine and to this day, they still joke about how it's my favorite game, so, which it's not. So we could not finish it. Like, so we played, I don't know how many turns we each took, but the game just was kind of like a hot mess. It was just a really big mess. Um, so it's got like a lot of stuff going on in it that just doesn't make sense, uh, I think. So, um, you're like going around the city and trying to like, I think, collect different items if I remember correctly. This was like a long time ago, so it's hard to remember all the details now. Um, there's like this character that you're trying to capture and kill. His name is Johnny, Johnny the Quick or something like that. There was like this own player board that you have that would kind of determine the number of movement points you have around this city. And then there was like this weird like kind of player board in which you would try to engage in battle like with other players and like you would have like these like kind of like see-through pieces that you would have to arrange on your board in some way it was the weirdest thing ever like it just i was just like what is this like this just it was just very kind of like frustrating i was like it was just i don't know if frustrating is the right word but like no, no one was enjoying it we just felt like it was there was just like too much luck in this game there was like cards you were drawing and you couldn't really like 
come up with a strategy of any kind. So yeah, so this game did not fund. And I actually went back uh, before I started shooting this video today to watch my overview video of it because I remember that I did not like this game. So I was curious about my, what my thoughts were on this game. So like, you know, I mentioned in my previous video uh, where I talked about morality or ethics in content creation. And I said that if it's a game, cause I, you know, when I end a one minute overview video, I always want to end it with something like, if I enjoy the game, like, oh, if you enjoy this, then check out this. If you like this, then check out this, you know? Um, but this game, since I did not like it, I actually ended it with, if you want to learn more about this game, then check it out on Kickstarter. So you could tell from the way I ended it that I did not have a positive opinion about this game. So I was paid to do an overview, which I did. So I provided an overview of how the game is played, but I did not provide a positive opinion at the end of that overview video. Um, I'm not sure if the game ever got published. Uh, I don't think it did. Um, yeah, but I did not have a positive opinion of that game and we did not finish it just because it was just very not enjoyable. So yeah, so those are the three games that I started playing but did not finish. And I think that those are the only ones that come to mind. So I would like to know which games you have started playing but did not finish because you just knew that it wasn't for you after a couple of turns or a round or two. Um, so yeah, so let me know in the comments and until next week, bye! Thank you.